Hi Chris, thanks so much for inviting me around to your lovely studio to do this interview. Let's dive straight in. You've run your record label Sprecken since around 2015, and when you're not being a label head, you're busy producing, DJing, and mentoring new talent in the city, not to mention doing a whole host of other creative projects around Manchester. So why produce an album now, and why do it under a new alias? Um, I think it just kind of like organically happened, to be honest. It was, um, it was as many, and it sounds a bit corny and sort of, uh, you know, treaded out saying it but it was during lockdown and obviously having so much time and being able to get into a certain headspace of just um you, you know not not having any preconceptions or preconceived ideas of doing stuff which i think i'd probably always and i think all of us do it you go into the studio sometimes carrying those preconceived ideas of what you've got to do and what you've got to create and i just i don't know i just started doing stuff i'd start off some guitar lessons as well um and so I just started to play around with sounds that normally wouldn't have fitted into, say, a house track. And it just kind of naturally flowed from there. Um, and so, yeah, there was about like seven tracks done. Um, I wanted it to get to ten, but sort of capped it at around about seven. Um, just a different approach to making music and a, a lot more relaxed, um, you know, being in a lot better headspace for doing it. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, I think it's it's come out feeling like the most truest thing that I've done and also I've kind of done it and it's not a case of um, having to make this music to get it somewhere or do, it's kind of been done for myself you know and it's like hopefully it sells and hopefully people like it but if not I've, I've really enjoyed the process of it um, I think doing it under another name um, obviously I've done quite a bit under my own name and that was quite synonymous with with clubs and club music and and dancing and, and DJing and I think with this although I like to be quite diverse in the music that I do it was probably a, a bit too much to try and say like oh I'm Chris Massey and I also do this music that's quite cinematic and synth heavy and and you know a soundscape so I've, I've kind of done it but I've, I've kept it as like a sort of a worst kept secret that it's me doing it mm -hmm. as in I've just shouted that it's me <laughs> <laughs> Uh, interesting what you said about preconceived notions, uh, you know, going into the studio, having to produce something to basically hit some sort of like maybe career milestone or goal. Um, I think we mentioned in our um, pre-interview catch up at, uh, at the pub that you were sort of saying like, you know, people tend to come to me or I go into um, the studio thinking like I need to make X amount of track, an X track to do Y, to either get booked somewhere or to do something. So did you know, sort of the slower pace of lockdown, like really enable you to sort of like get, take guitar lessons and just do these different, like experiment with these different sounds. And is that a bit where that thief of time came from? Do you think, am I maybe clutching at straws here to suggest that the thief of time is maybe you getting all that time in lockdown that you can then use to, to, to work on this project? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the name came from, um, it was actually in a Tales from the Crypt comic that I was reading, which I've got a big collection of. Um, and I thought, well, that sounds quite cool. Um, and it's it basically means procrastination. Um, like procrastination is a thief of time, which it is. Like even today, I've just the amount of procrastinating I've done, and, and I am terrible for it. You know, really terrible. So that's kind of where where the name for it came from. Um, and yeah, I think it, it it certainly was. There was there was more time. And it sounds really corny saying it now, do you know what I mean? But it, but it really was within lockdown. There was just like a lot of time to um, not reflect, do you know what I mean? Basically, I was just able to like, you know, get off the tracks because everything that I do is now like a million miles an hour. And it, particularly just before lockdown, I was spinning so many plates of, of various events and for various other people um, that it was a time to just be able to, you know, it was, it was a enforced sort of chill out for us all, you know, and I, I was in a very lucky position that I was, I was financially stable with, with work that I got paid for and then the government grant coming through. Mm -hmm. uh, and I also was, was very, very lucky to be, to be able to pick up work through lockdown as well. Um, but just having that time to just be able to sit and, and just, um, yeah, not think, oh, I've got a day in the studio today and I, and I need to put out a banger that's going to go on Radio 1 or it's got to get me this, it's got to get me that. You know, it was just in there and just, you know, I, I like, I've got a diverse love of music and styles and stuff. So it was just a case of, you know, exploring that. But there wasn't any grandmaster plan. It wasn't like, yeah, I'm going to make some really contemporary sounding, you know, album and it's going to be this. It's, you know, there was no, nothing like that at all. It was just going in there 
and just you know I love film soundtracks I love synth heavy bands and um, you know I'm a, born in 1980 so that's a lot of that sort of style and aesthetic mm-hmm. runs throughout you know how, how I dress um, you know mm-hmm. what I'm into and comics and films that I like and I suppose really it was it's just all them influences but yeah I couldn't honestly sit there you know I suppose that's where it came from I couldn't honestly sit, sit there and say yes this was a direct influence or this or I was in this mindset it was just going in and, and going with the floor Mm-hmm. Um, that does bring on really nicely to the next point though and the next question I wanted to ask you um, the album feels like it's coming from a very personal place uh, you've got tracks like Imposter Syndrome uh, and We'll Find Each Other um, it seems like the album is at least semi-biographical would I be right in thinking that? Yeah I think so I mean I, um, I'd i never written lyrics before I'd, I'd certainly never sung or anything like that and I always kind of felt really silly um, writing lyrics um which again is, is probably an, another you know symptom of the imposter syndrome thing and that's you know that as a track in, on its own that that is from that personal experience and that isn't so that's something that i've kind of always suffered with still and I, and I still do you know what i mean um and i think a lot of creatives do to be honest i think a lot of people do ju- just in general you know the amount of people i've spoken to since the tracks come out that they've sort of um appreciated it's a bit of a voice to it and, and that but um it's you know that track in particular came around it was um you know the music kind of came first and then the um and then the the lyrics after it you know but it was my friend mike who was giving me guitar lessons who's an incredible guitarist as well he, he sort of makes music as uh, love letters from space and he's featured quite a lot on the album but he really helped me in terms of uh song structure and you know writing lyrics you know, because it would just be, you, you kind of think of a lyric and then you'd be like, oh, it sounds silly, that. it sounds stupid. But, you know, he kind of taught me where it's like, you know, if if you break down, you know, song lyrics of songs that, you know, if you're just reading them, then they kind of all sound, you know, they're all, it doesn't it come across the same. You know, it's how it's performed and how it's wrapped around the music as well. So he massively helped me. Um, he massively helped me with, with doing that. Um, and... I think it is it is sort of semi autobiographical. Um, some songs more, more than others, but it certainly wasn't set out with the intent to do that. Um, I just think there were certain tracks that I had a vibe, and I thought, oh yeah, I could maybe do something with this. And I suppose it's that age old thing, and it you know write about what you know. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's where you know write about imposter syndrome. They will find each other. It's a, like a track about. You know, life and you know obstacles that get thrown up at you, and it's you know you know who you're supposed to be with, and you have to you know in a relationship or even a marriage, you know you have to navigate those waters, and you have to make it work. And there's there's up and there's downs, and you have to kind of get through it with each other. And it's about like you know mutual respect and support. Um, and you know on a personal level, it's like this the support I've been given by my wife throughout everything. You know, she's. Um, Certainly never told me to get a real job or anything. So she's always supportive of what I do. So I just thought it'd be nice to do something for her, you know, and the type of song. I wanted to do a big 80s synthy, you know, stranded at the prom kind of track and just create some lyrics around that. So that's where that one came from. And then, and then, you know, I suppose we are the, 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 the two that are directly autobiographical. Um, the other ones are just you know, massively influenced from uh, tracks and artists and um, and producers that, that I like and I, and I admire. Come on, name a few. <laughs> name a few. You can't, you can't leave me hanging. <laughs> um, I think... I mean, I'll put you on the spot. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, shit, now I'm going to think of all these, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, I tell you what, the, the, the biggest one would is um, like film soundtracks mm-hmm. by uh, Brad Fidel who he did the soundtrack for Terminator. He kind of came up with the Terminator theme. But he also did like an incredible soundtrack for um, Fright Night, which is like a favourite sort of 80s horror film of mine. But the but the sort of soundtrack that he does for it is very kind of stripped back. You know, there's there's like a real, almost like quite chintzy, cheesy guitar in the very 80s. Um, but just very stripped back and like lots of just like two tone bass kind of going on and stuff in there. Um, but then you know, in a in a similar relation to that is like you know Clint Mansell 
he uh, you know did a lot of music for Black Mirror um, and also for Drive, the uh, Ryan Gosling film. But related to that is a lot of um, you know Mike Simonetti on Italians do it better and, and Chromatics. I mean they will find each other track especially. I really wanted that to have a Chromatics sound because they're you know very influential. Um, in terms of style and sound, but I kind of also didn't, I didn't want the whole thing to be too much on the chin. You know, I think there's a lot of stuff, like I, I, a lot of like, oh God, it goes, it goes under so many names, doesn't it? Like Synthwave and like Dreamwave and all stuff like that. And it's really cool, but some of it, it's like, yeah, we kind of get it, you're influenced by the 80s, do you know what I mean? But I like stuff that just kind of magpies a little bit around things. And that's called Memorex Memories, actually. He like, um, Pictures of Purple Skies, an album, but also the, the name of the single as well. That was like massively influential. Um, he's like a Scottish based producer, mm-hmm. and it's the stuff he did. It's very kind of synth heavy, and instinctively it's kind of 80s sounding, but it's not, you know, a complete like Lynn drums and this and this and stuff like that. So, and that's just, I mean, that's how I am with, with DJing and collecting music anyway. It's like I like to have that magpie approach and just, mm-hmm. and strad, you, you know. And Sprecken, I suppose, as you know, talk, well, yeah, yeah, actually, you know, as as a label, it's very much bits of things, but it's never too much of one thing. And I think the album is probably quite representative of that. No, it definitely is. Obviously, I've listened to it quite a few times, um, and yeah, you know, everything from you know, the, this, you've got synth heavy tracks through to the more like reserved, you know, vocals and guitar. Yeah, like, yeah. Everything in there. It's uh, when I first listened to it, I was, I know you said it was a very different thing under a different moniker, but I was like, no, oh, this is. This is a different thing under a different Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which was, uh, which was amazing to, uh, to like, listen to. And know. it's good, you know. I mean, the thing... I mean, a lot of people... The, the, the Love Letters from Space track, especially, there's a, several people who've mentioned that as just saying, like, an Andrew Weatherall track, which for me was... I mean, I, <clears throat> you know, Andrew Weatherall was just, like, influential in, in not just, like, a, you know, musically or as a DJ, but just as a whole kind of phenomenon and, and kind of person and, and personality, you know, so... He certainly wasn't at the forefront of what I was thinking when with, with this music or anything like that. Um, but obviously, someone I massively respected. So it's been really good to hear that, you know, people name check that particular track as sounding like something that he'd he'd have done. You know, which is which is pretty. You know, certainly wasn't expecting that. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. I mean, it's a bit of a big compliment. Yeah. It? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um. So as you've already mentioned, uh, you've taken quite a lot of uh, creative leaps for this album that you haven't before. You've already mentioned a few times that you've been learning guitar. Um, you provide your voice for a few too. You don't go as far as to sing, but you do like a sort of like a voiceover. Spoken yeah, word on the imposter syndrome track. Yeah. yeah, and on the we'll find each other a bit of sort of backing vocals, and that was just a case of having just you know from having no confidence of, of certain things to to kind of suddenly having the confidence to try it and I think being in the, going back to you know the early question about being in lockdown is just having that well yeah there's time to try this if it works it works if it sounds naff it sounds naff you know so what whereas before that I always kind of had a real worry of like it's got to be brilliant it's got to be ash you know what I mean it was like you know the um uh, just having the, the the glory of just the time where it's like, oh, try this if it sounds good, cool, you know, and that and that's the right way to produce music, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? It's like you should never go in there with a with a, a, di- a, a definite direction or preconceived idea, you know. Is that thing of like, yeah, do it for yourself and what and what sounds right, you know? Um, I wanted to ask as well, like how how did it feel, you know? Because, you know, you produced loads of like, you know, dance floor focused tracks, and so you know, you've very much been in the studio in front of the screen you know with you know your synths controllers it's been you know creating dance music and like creating music with a band so mm. how did you find sort of jumping over and maybe doing a bit more of the sort of you know collaborative you know working with the band or playing in guitars as opposed to just you know sat in front of ableton like tweaking the automation was it a new think, was it liberating was it a bit daunting how, how oh, did you find it trust me there was loads of automation tweaking going on because <laughs> um, that's a big thing of mine is just washing stuff in reverb especially mm. on this but i think i think what was what was quite um you know connecting the dots in it is that whenever i've made tracks before or, or dance tracks um i would always make something and then i would be like oh it doesn't sound like what's being played on radio one or what animax playing it doesn't sound like this you, you know and i get really frustrated but then the tracks that I'd done, which were like pretty wonky or weird, um, 
are the ones that you know people would would really buzz off. You know, they'd be like, "Well, this is your sound. This is great. This is awesome." Um, and you know, it's always it's always quite scary putting something of yourself out there. But what I kind of found with this project was being able to sort of embrace that kind of stuff and just put it out there. Um, and not be bothered that it's like, oh, it doesn't sound like a Radio 1 dance, you know, it doesn't sound like that, you know what I mean, of just just being able to kind of, you know, embrace all those sounds, and even though it's not quite really a 4-4 album, do you know what I mean? It's like a lot of those stuff, techniques and sounds that I would incorporate onto those mm-hmm. are sort of present here, and I just felt a lot more comfortable being in this um, lane, I suppose mm-hmm. is the best way to describe it, um, and producing this this, this kind of music. Um, which are, you, you know, I've, I've, I've weirdly since doing this, kind of like um, it just I feel like it's kind of opened my confidence more a bit, you know, in terms of dance tracks that I've started to produce in the background. That there's a project I'm doing with Elliot from the editors, um, that's very kind of Italo, uh, a dark Italo sounding, you know, it's straight up club tracks and stuff, um, and th- a lot of that and those techniques that I've sort of picked up through doing this. And having that kind of mindset, I've been able to then put into doing that stuff, and it's that even that still sounds quite unique and different. But it's not me trying to do a track that is like, like I said, the same as what you know, the same as what everyone else is perceived as doing. I move on to my next question, and I'd be right in saying that this is very much a solo project. You know, this is you know this is a whole you know created by you. Um, that being said. You're certainly not the only person who has a hand in creating it. You know, you have been the overall producer. It is, you know, the a, you know a Chris Massey Thief of Time production. But there's been a lot of people who have uh, done guest vocals or you've collaborated with. Um, most of the tracks on the album feature either guest singers or regular spec and collaborators. So was it important for you to bring in external voices into the album? And how did these singers? imprint their own bit of creative flair onto the tracks they provided vocals for? Yeah, a, a, a kind of, a bit of everything, I suppose. It was like, with, with some stuff, because it was quite new and uncharted territory, it seemed, I mean, like, you know, the way that the guitar is on some of the tracks, there's no way that I could have done guitar mm-hmm. to that level. Um, similar with vocals as well, you, you know. And, I mean, like, I, I always end up doing, collaborating with people on loads of stuff, to be honest with you. Mm-hmm. I just always seem to end up doing it. Um, but I kind of thought with this, it's it's I like working with other people. I like working with local creatives, you know, whether they're established or, you know, kind of emerging or coming through or sort of established in, in their own right. So I just thought if it's... <laughs> I just thought, <laughs> Album two, that's where we'll be, yeah. Um, no, I just, I just thought it's, um, it's, you know, you kind of get more out of it and it's it's like skill sharing I suppose you know mm. so so the, the Pavement Soul track you know that in particular I had an idea I'd written some lyrics for it and um, I got in contact with uh, Nix who's a, a promoter and DJ and, and performer who's she, she's incredible you know and I'd, I'd kind of spoke to her very briefly in the past because she works for Melodic Distraction or she was working for Melodic Distraction um, and she's moved to Levenzoom now so she's Manchester based and Josh at Melodic Distraction, I was chatting to him and talking about these tracks, and I said, I'm really after like a, a great female vocal that's quite ethereal sounding. And he said, oh, you should speak to Kate, like Nix. Um, so we touched base, and I had a meeting with her, and I sent her the track, and um, I explained what it was about, which was a, a, a guy that I used to see was kind of asking for spare change, where we used to live in Stratford. And she was like, oh, yeah, I've seen that guy loads of times. you know. So she knew the kind of concept and that, and it was about sort of... You know the personality of this person, and and you know clearly what where they are and what they're doing now. That the, you know we're all human beings. There's a story there. They've got family, or they've had family, and so on. But um, I'd written some lyrics, and I laid down a guide vocal. But I said to her, I said, look, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not precious about this. So it, I kind of did a bit, a bit spoken word in the breakdown, and then I tried it similar in the uh, sort of intro bit. But it needed, it wasn't verse chorus or anything like that. Mm-hmm. And I sent it to Kate, and um, she sent it back. <laughs> it was just like she'd totally like she'd written like an intro, a verse, a bridge. She would stacked it and layered it and harmonies and stuff like that, and it and it was phenomenal. You know, I mean, something that I could never have done. And and the way that again we're going back to talking about lyrics, the the lyrics that she'd written were so simple, but the way that she'd done them and just wrapped them around the the how she delivered them, 
I, I wouldn't know to do that, you know what I mean? So um, that was just, yeah, I mean, it's it, it's one of my favourite tracks on, on the album, that. Um, and, yeah, I think it's just I think it's just that thing of, of just working with other people. They just bring other things to the... To, to the plate you know you can, you can direct people as much as possible but then you can I, I'm very much just like look you know this is the track you know I like this kind of vibe or this or this this singer going for this sort of you know saying this is what I'm hearing and then just see see what they deliver you know I mean Mike who like I mentioned before is Love Letters from Space he's been so instrumental throughout all of this album because he's especially on the guitar I mean he's like he, he will literally just sit there and you'll just be like so what a guitar that sounds like this and he'll just kind of sit there and just blast it out like Eddie Van Halen and then he's like right see you later you know because he's just he's he's that good with it you know what I mean but he also he's a little bit younger than me but kind of similar sort of interests well no, very similar interests in terms of films and what we're into and stuff like that so people people just get it I think you know and once you're into music and certain music you just kind of understand it you know a certain ratio obviously it's, it's just great to work with those guys because they're just super talented you know what I mean and super busy but with this you know they took time out just to be able to literally just jam a few things on there which was which was great yeah amazing uh, another thing you mentioned in our pre-interview catch-up um, is that you'd really love to perform this album live is that an idea that really excites you uh, maybe scares you a little how do you think you'd perform live, you know, full band, just two or three people? Is you know, is it something you've done before? Is that another big leap that you're looking? Yeah, no, thinking? not at all. You know, I mean, you no, know, it terrifies me, but not as much as it. You know, when I was when I was starting the project, it was just a case of making some music, and I think as it was getting created, it was like, oh, it could work actually this live, and I quite like live electronic stuff when it's more than just like someone stood there just twiddling some knobs on a, on, on a little control. I think it's got to be quite. Um, you know something to focus on so I mean Mike you know again from the get go he's like yeah I'd love to record this live and he's fantastic you know and he, and he looks the part and he's great um, What I, I would have loved Nix to have been part of it as a full time thing but she's just she, she's so busy with her own um, stuff um, which sounds and looks great um, so it would need to have like a vocalist in there as well that, although I'm Excuse me. I am speaking to somebody um, about being involved on that front. So I, yeah, I mean, I would, I would like to when we do the album launch later in the year to be able to perform it live. I mean, I just had a meeting this week about how to go about that because obviously there's like an entry level to do it, and then there's like so much more that you can do with it. And it's like for me, I've never ever done anything like that before. So it needs to be quite straightforward, as stress free as possible. Um, but I don't want to just be there and just top of the pops in it kind of thing you know what I mean I'd love to be able to play the guitar bits on that that I, that I personally recorded and even though they're only kind of like three keys I even had to overdub them because I was just like slipping my fingers everywhere and stuff but I don't know I suppose it's just practice isn't it you know what I mean and it's I mean, like yeah. you're only going to get one first gig and you've got to start somewhere yeah, yeah 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 you know it's just it's just rehearsal isn't it and, mm -hmm. and, and, and just practicing it so um I'd like to because I'd like to just incorporate a whole thing of like having visuals with it, and obviously because there is guest people that are Manchester based with it, you know it could be quite cool. You know, Bear Brian, who's who's like the vocalist on Imposter Syndrome, uh, Psychedelic, who's who's on uh, one of the tracks, um, and Nick's, you know what I mean, who are all Manchester based. It could very much be a case of like you know, welcome to the stage, <laughs> such a person, and and bringing them up, and that that's what I'd really like to do with it. Um, and yeah, you know, I mean, I don't know, maybe it's a midlife crisis or what, I don't know, but I'm, I'm quite, yeah, I'm definitely keen to explore it, De definitely, I mean, you I know. Don't, I don't think it's a midlife crisis. <laughs> I think you've done enough music previous to this <laughs> that it's not a midlife crisis. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. If you decided to, like, do a David Brent... And Rip the t-shirt off and just. Uh, and, you know, <laughs> yeah, at, it's not at that. Forty years old, all of a sudden, you know, spend forty grand on yeah. producing an album. Then I might, you know, raise an eyebrow. But you know, yeah, yeah, as yeah. a seasoned Manchester producer who's decided to make an album, I, <laughs> I wouldn't say it's that. Like, <laughs> but even saying it's an album still feels really bold because it was like I say, it was just a collection of tracks. That even when I was doing it, I was like thinking, oh god, the the do sound quite different. You know what I mean? But then I was like, actually, if you put them together. And again, what what Sprecken's like itself, it's not, I don't, I think there's a common thread between them all, do you know what I mean? And, I, and I've always done that with anything that I've done. It's like, if you like going out to a club and you like dancing and stuff, you know, the chances are you, you'll listen to 
crazy P or LCD sound system or Young Fathers or something. Do, do you know what I mean? That, that's music that's maybe not quite directly peak town club stuff, but it's it's you, you know it's got it's it's interesting as well. Um, and that's what I tried to do with this is is kind of like keep it quite varied and interesting and a bit of an insight into how my uh, head works. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting again. I don't know. I'll jump on this quickly because um, when you mentioned it, it made me ears prick up. Then that common thread between tracks because that's something you know. People listen to albums differently to the way they listen to a mix. Differently to the way they listen, differently to the way they listen to individual tracks. And difficult getting that out. Um, so yeah, with that, you know, did it just come together that organically, and you didn't really have to think about, you know, this album is a journey. It needs to have like a, a start, a middle, and an end. Um, that wasn't something that really you thought about. You more had the tracks that came together organically and then it did, you know, they just fit, it just clicks sort of thing. Yeah, it was, it was more when the tracks had been done and the decision was to do it as an album because I think at first I was debating to do it as just like an EP because it's going out on vinyl and I just thought, do I split it over two vinyls and do it as like four tracks on each? Um, do I do it as two tracks and two remixes? But then again, I just thought, but then it's just almost like going down a road of, you know, I've done these two tracks and then just getting two people to do like club remixes and stuff. And I was like, as much as, you know, we still do that on Sprecken and stuff. I was just like with this, I was, and it, you know, it wasn't to not invite anyone else to the party. I was just like, no, you know, I've got, there's just something here and it's just, it's something of, of me. Do you know what I mean? So uh, that was, that was the sort of thing of, of, of putting it out like that. But again, it was only when the tracks had been done that it was like, it was. It, I was. I mean, I don't know. Is it an extended EP or is it an album? I, I don't know. It was only when Neil from Clampdown, I can't remember what the band was that he was on about, and he said, "Oh no, they put an album out, and it was like six tracks or something, um, and it was only like twenty five minutes long." And I was like, "Oh yeah, I suppose it's an album then." Yeah, but it still yeah. feels quite bold to say it's an I album. I mean, I mean, is anybody, you know, is anybody, you know, counting? Uh, yeah, is the, al- <laughs> are the album please going to turn up and be like, "I'm sorry, it's a ten track minimum." Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. You, know, you can do what you want, really. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, that is all the questions I've got for you. Nice. Um, I mean, as always, it's really great being talking to you. Um, and thank you so, so much for inviting me around and letting all my friends have like a sneak peek. Yeah, thanks uh, for coming. The whole album and the production process and your amazing studio. I suppose the final, final question for me would be when are we going to see the whole album released? Will there be a vinyl release, which you did say there was? Um, but yeah, will there be? When will that be dropping? And uh, when's the launch party? And are we going to be playing live at it? Um, well, I've actually these are the test pressings of the album, which I got through this week, which are sounding good, really, really good. Oh, fantastic. Couple of little like vinyl imperfections, but I just mm. think I've, I've sort of learned over time that it's like. You know, if you knock it back for certain imperfections, you'll be waiting another like eight months to get it out. Mm-hmm. Um, so yes, it is getting a vinyl release um, because of the sort of vibe of it, and it's and and the sort of it's it's almost. Some people said is it a concept album, which it, uh, what what I decided to do is run with that a little bit, mm-hmm. and I created a synopsis for each of the tracks. Mm-hmm. And my man who does uh, Tom Bevan, who does the artwork for the sleeves, because we're going to do like a screen printed sleeve, he's going to work. For through those synopsises that I've done and create a piece of artwork for each track. Mm -hmm. So when we do the album launch, it'll also be an art exhibition as well because there's kind of a loose narrative through it, but it's also open to, you know, interpretation as as well. Um, So, yeah, as as, as well as the vinyl release, um, yeah, um, so Tom will do an art exhibition that will tie in with it as well, you know, probably some prints for sale. Um, and I think, you know, I, I, I mean, I love creating videos and visuals and stuff, and I was quite keen on creating some visuals that could probably be a backdrop to the live performance and then maybe create, put them together as like with the music and do it as like a DVD and do like a design that's like a real old school looking video, uh, you know, and, ju- yeah, and just do like yeah. 10 or 15 of them just to have it look as something that's quite cool, you know. I, I might do some cassettes as well if I can get them cheap enough, though. I've, I mean, I've still got about 50 cassettes under there from a previous release that I haven't sold. Uh, if anyone wants to buy one, go on the Bandcamp page. <laughs> um, and yeah, launch party. I mean, um, I'm just chatting with Marco from Sticky Heat because we might do a support slot on a gig that me and him are going to put on, but I don't know yet. But I would like there to be something quite central around it. And like I say, bringing in everyone who's been involved with the album. Um, 
you know to perform on it as well it's just very early days on performing so I need, I need to crack on with that so yeah hopefully hopefully mm -hmm. sounds great and you have uh, August is the album release do you have a specific date yet or is it more a, a watch and watch well no it's looking it's potentially October for the album okay. release um, but it might you know if it gives us a bit more time to rehearse and so that I might push it back to December I mean yeah. I have all the record sleeves kind of here mm -hmm. um, I just want to get ahead of the curve on this one you know what I mean so yeah. Um, but I, I do need to, and I, I also need to chase Tom down about the artwork. Um, but yeah, it's kind of all the re ready to go, and it's you know I've got a guy locally who does my printing as well, which is great. So it's all very sort of locally Manchester based as well. Amazing, brilliant! Thank you so much again Cheers, for man. chatting to us today. It's been really good coming round, uh, and we'll see you. Well, we'll definitely see you before the launch party, but we'll see you at the launch party. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cheers, man. Fantastic, amazing. Good, good. Cool.